Good evening, I am Boris, and I'm going to explain to you the principles behind the correct explanation of why superpowers clashed over Germany. I would like to state on record that I am convinced that my revisionist interpretation is correct, and that capitalist pigs caused the division of Germany and constant tension in the area due to the weakness of capitalism and their own selfish desires to promote their own interests. Let me first start by saying that the great leader Stalin had absolutely no intention of controlling Germany as a puppet state, and he certainly did not want to divide Germany. He worked tirelessly to avoid it, in fact, but every attempt was dismissed by the capitalist dogs. Of course, they will point to Das Kapital and the supposed communist desire to rule the world. In doing this, they ignore Stalin's, uh, well, how he abolished Comintern in 1943 and publicly stated his desire upon taking power to focus on socialism in one state. It is merely capitalist propaganda to spread rumor and fear with regards to the glorious motherland of the Soviet Union. Yeah! Hello and welcome to the traditional explanation of why the superpowers clashed over Germany during the Cold War. From me, Bruce. The superpowers, of course, being the United States of America and the despicable, sneaky, communist rats in the Soviet Union. I think to all who study the facts of the Cold War, it's pretty clear that it boils down to an aggressive move by the communists to spread their ideology across the globe as far as they could. I mean it's written in their goddamn book for crying out loud. If you read Das Kapital, you'll find that the commies believed that communism is bound to spread across the globe and that existing communist countries should support those that were new to it and encourage the spread of communism. Of course, you'll hear the commies tell you that it was just theory. And Stalin publicly stated that he wanted to focus on just the Soviet Union with his idea of socialism in one country. Ha, you know what I say? I say fooey. Why the heck would you maintain the existence of Comintern, an organization specifically created to encourage the spread of communism, all the way up it existed to 1943, and then Common Form of 1947, in which Communist Party members from across Europe, including France and Italy, could attend and receive support and advice and direction from Moscow? How can they possibly argue that the communists wanted anything other than to spread communism in the face of all that evidence. So one of the key reasons why we clashed over Germany is because we, capitalists, heroically aided the German people in their attempt to throw off the oppression of their communist tormentors whilst the Soviets were determined to oppose communism, impose communism on Germany, completely against the wishes of the German people. So let us start with a bit of background, to dispel the capitalist lies and rumors that they have not tried to get in your head, and be particularly careful if you meet a man named Bruce. He is typical of the drug-fueled, crime-ridden capitalist states of the West, and clearly, clearly cannot be trusted. So to begin. The Soviet Union was decimated by the fascist invasion from Nazi Germany during the Second World War. And, as was our right, we demanded reparations, and guarantees that Germany would never again be able to invade. The ghosts of 25 million Soviet citizens stood at our shoulder, as we dealt with Germany, and whilst we did this, what did the capitalists do? They told us, to our face, that they would provide us with reparations from their zones in Germany. And then, in 1947, they broke their promises and stopped sending reparations with the British claiming that they could not afford to continue to pay for their occupation. <laughs> this was not something we had agreed upon and not something we would agree to at all. It was a typically selfish act from people with a selfish ideology. Then they formed Bisonia in an attempt to make Germany strong again. Why would they do this, other than to attempt to turn Germany into a capitalist state in their own image, directed and controlled to oppose the Soviets? 
and in the meantime completely breaking all promises they ever made. Now who's the bad guy? Hm? Let's delve into a bit of a blow-by-blow -blow account of how things worsened from 1948 onwards as a result of the actions of the Soviet Union and particularly Stalin himself and how we worked, we worked in the interests of the German people to defend their freedom and their right to choose their own leaders through a real democracy, not the sham democracy of the ironically named German Democratic Republic. Ha! <laughs> Democratic, my hairy ass. So to 1948, and what I believe is your focus for the purpose of this briefing. Do not mistake me, we were perhaps a little vengeful at first. But we did have the interests of Germany at heart, in post-war Germany. We just did not want another attack in the future. Nor did we want an American-dominated country on our doorstep. Our good friend, Walter Ulbricht, even tried to send a delegation to London, as part of what was known as the German People's Congress for Unity and a Just Peace. This group wanted a united Germany. Exactly the opposite of what the capitalists seem to want, and exactly what the ordinary German citizens seem to want. Germans from across both East and West wanted to travel to the London Conference. What did the capitalists do? Bevin, the slimy, sneaky, capitalist pig that he was, banned the Germans from travelling to London. Typical. Who had the interests of the Germans at heart then? Bevin? Ha! Don't make me laugh. Because I don't often do it. Maybe once a year. My mom is American pie. The capitalists then held a second London conference, in which they begin to make plans for a West German state. Let me just remind you that we had done absolutely nothing to deserve this. I am convinced that the West wanted a divided Germany so they could take advantage of the rich industrial heartland of the Ruhr region, the Rhineland, to fill their greedy pockets. In response, to this provocation, we Soviets did nothing. We did not react as honorable men would not. But we could no longer stand back when Britain, France and the USA introduced a new currency to Germany without even consulting us and with no warning at all. So, let's summarize here so far. They stopped paying for reparations that they had agreed specifically that they would pay at the end of the war. Then they formed Bisonia and tried to develop the German economy. Totally the opposite of what we wanted. Then they banned the German People's Congress from unity from entering Britain. Then they made plans for a West German state and then they introduced a currency without consulting us at all. Heavy but the levy was dry and good old boy. So, we had little choice but to try a show of force to intimidate the West into stepping back from this mad and selfish path by blockading Berlin. What else could we do? Stand by and let the West do as they please as they break promises, abandon all chance of a united Germany and try to impose capitalism on the whole of Germany? Of course not. They left us with no choice. In retrospect, it was a bad decision, because it resulted in the Berliners being thankful to the Americans. But they didn't realize that we did it for them. If we hadn't stood up to the capitalists, then all hope of a united Germany would be lost. After our heroic and brave stand to try to stop uh, the Americans spreading their capitalist ways all across Berlin, all hope of a united Germany was sadly lost. Or at least it was from the capitalist side. We continued to try to unite Germany. We were the good guys in this. Anyway, the obvious starting point is the Berlin blockade of June 1948. Stalin responded to the introduction of the Deutschmark by trying to force us to abandon the people of Berlin to communist domination, something we weren't going to do. His plan to gain control of the whole of Berlin was to prevent supplies reaching West Berlin, which would inevitably have led, and did lead, to the suffering of the German people. 
It was this obvious and blatant bullying tactic which highlights quite clearly that German people did not want to be bullied into accepting German domination. And the gratitude of the Germans towards the airlift was strong and obvious. Don't want to be an American, idiot! It only needed one accident during the exceptionally tense 11 months of airlift. Say if uh, one Soviet aircraft flying close to Western transports had caused an air incident, and we would have been looking at World War Three, And for what? So Stalin could spread communism and his influence just a little further? We introduced the Deutschmark for the benefit of the German people, as evidenced by the phenomenal economic recovery of the West German economy through the 50s and 60s, known as the German economic miracle. We helped that. The Soviets, what did they do? Enforced a blockade on the Berliners for their own selfish reasons. This really highlights why the traditionalist interpretation is the right interpretation. Of course, the failure of the German blockade simply gave the capitalists the idea that they could bully us from then on. They'd been successful once, they thought they would continue to be. So, they basically made the international equivalent of a street bully gang with the formation of NATO in 1948, a military alliance. They said it was to protect Europe in the event of a strong Germany developing military ambitions. <laughs> Lying, filthy pigs. Surely people could not have been taken in by these lies. It was obviously an attempt to build a military alliance against the Soviet Union. And all communists everywhere as well. Singing, this will be the day that I die. This will be the day that I die. They further showed their selfish hearts by forming the Federal Republic of Germany in the West in May 1949. Let me state categorically here that the Soviet Union and the Communists of Germany did not create a split Germany. We did not create our country first. The German Democratic Republic was created after the West created their country. We still hoped to bring Germany all together as German people wanted. But we had no choice, of course, we had to form a country. It was another example of capitalist bullying. And it wasn't until October, so they did this in May, we still held on till October before we finally created the GDR. Of course, the blockade itself cost those that supplied Berlin millions of dollars. It cost us an absolute fortune to pay for this. And in the beginning, it was a real possibility that Berlin would have to be abandoned. We could never be caught short like this again. Not in the face of Soviet aggression. So... We decided in the West that we would band together and form NATO so that we could respond to uh, any emergency of the future a bit quicker than we did with the Berlin blockade. It was, NATO was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and it was formed in April 1949. It was kind of a case of collective security and, and a move that was completely necessary as proven by the Berlin blockade. We didn't, and I categorically want to state, did not do this to try to provoke the Soviets, we did this because the Soviets had blockaded Berlin. What other choice did we have? The West continued to spread lies and propaganda, assuming that North Korea invaded South Korea on Stalin's orders in 1950, when there is no evidence that Stalin did any such thing. Of course, he may have hinted that he was willing to let it happen, but he did not order it. This was just an excuse for the capitalists in the West to grow their own armed forces and therefore their influence in Europe. The French even proposed the formation, in light of what they saw as a communist attempt to take over the whole world, of a European defense community, the EDC. They proposed this in October 1950. Thankfully, at the time, the French were in the end too nervous about German rearmament to let the Germans arm themselves. Uh, and the whole idea did fall through. Although only until 1955, when West Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, were allowed to join the capitalist bully gang of NATO. Complete provocation of the Soviets, this. Why would they let the Germans join their gang? But uh, back to the early 1950s, the US, not content with trying to dominate the world economy, 
take control of Germany and spread propaganda, decided to risk the entire world and world peace by funding a huge build-up in rearmaments across Europe. Martial aid. Oh, glorious martial aid. Supposed to help all these free people in the world. Well, by the 50s, it was being purposefully directed to industries that would support warfare. And then they scrapped martial aid altogether and just simply sent military supplies, military aid to different countries. America was arming Europe. The United States were giving weapons to all countries that it had brought under its influence. There can only be one, one reason for this. To intimidate us and to force us to rearm at the same time. Knowing as they did that our co economy was weakened by the world war that had ravaged our land and not the land of the United States. Despicable, irresponsible behavior that ramped up the pressure and the tension in the world and only made nuclear war more likely. They turned up the pressure so much so that NATO countries increased military spending from $4.4 billion in 1949 to just two years later an entire $8 billion in 1951. That's $8,000 million just on armaments from the United States. In 1950, communists in North Korea invaded South Korea. What does this have to do with Germany? Well, it has a lot to do with Germany, because Walter Ulbricht, the leader of the SED, publicly stated his support for North Korea, uh, and seemed to hint that he thought it would be a good idea, or a good way, in which the whole of Germany could be reunited if the GDR invaded the FRG. Another example of communist intentions and of communists ramping up the tension in Germany. Ulbricht didn't stop there either. He decided to create a paramilitary police force of a massive 60,000 men. So when you add this to the fact that Ulbricht kept going on about liberating West Germany, then you can really see why German people started to worry, as did the rest of Europe and us in the US of A. And what was the Soviet Union doing whilst the United States worked to increase the likelihood of nuclear war by building up so many armaments in Europe? Well, we did rearm. We had very little choice if we were going to prevent the US bullying tactics. But that is not all we did. We didn't want nuclear annihilation of the world. <laughs> Stalin launched Stalin, you're the person who the Western capitalists mention all the time as being this evil domineering man. He launched the World Peace Council in early 1951 and tried to lead the noble cause of banning all nuclear weapons. That's right, all nuclear weapons, including those of the Soviet Union. The response of the capitalists? I'm sure you can probably guess by now. Well, they tried to claim that we didn't mean what we said, and dismissed the idea. Stalin was not just going to let this lie, though. He sent what is now known as the Stalin Note of March 1952 in which he request, requested for elections to be held in a united Germany and so as to reassure the people that there would be no fixed elections, he suggested that all four occupying powers of France, Britain, the US and the USSR could all send witnesses to supervise the elections to prevent corruption. His only demand was that a united Germany would not be allowed to join NATO. That was it. And do you know what the capitalists did? After all of this, they just ignore it. After everything the West had put us through in Germany and all that sneaky vile tactics, we were still willing to put the German people first. Unite Germany and allow... F this is an extra bit. We even said with the Stalin note we would forget reparations. Think of that as a gesture. What did the capitalists do? Ignored us. So we had little option but to try to help the section of Germany that we controlled and we started transforming the economy into a communist economy. I mean seriously. What else could we do? There seemed to be no offer that we could make that the West would accept. They seemed purely and simply to be determined to divide Europe and hold on to power and influence wherever they could. That we continued to work 
for world peace and for a united Germany in the face of all of this makes me proud to have been a Soviet citizen. <sighs> so proud. <laughs> Stalin wasn't keeping quiet either at this time. He was worried about the free, democratic people of Europe and worried that they got together to create NATO as protection against his bullying tactics. And Stalin tried something incredibly sneaky, and I gotta give him his due. He tried to make himself look like the good guy, though with a moustache like that and the deaths of millions during his period in charge, I'm not fooled, and I hope you're not either. Stalin put himself at the head of something called the World Peace Movement, with its very own World Peace Council, with its members, obviously, dominated by communists. Stalin called for disarmament, and in particular of the banning of the atomic bomb. We weren't fooled. Like I said, it was a clever attempt by a cunning wolf, like Stalin, to try to get us to destroy our atomic bombs. No doubt so he could secretly try to create his own and overtake us in the arms race. Back in the USSR. I love what British PM Attlee said about it all when he said that the World Peace Movement and the World Peace Council were a bogus forum of peace with the real aim of sabotaging national defense. Right on, Clement. You show those Bolsheviks. Co-team, USA, you... Anyway, it was ironic that Mr. World Peace himself, Stalin that is, had in 1948, just a year before the World Peace Movement, quadrupled the amount of tanks and the amount of artillery produced by the Soviet Union, and had developed and tested his own atomic bomb in September 1949. He set up his World Peace Movement in November 1949. Ha! <laughs> yeah, right. You're not fooling me, Joe, with your call for world peace. <laughs> Stalin stepped it up a notch by sending something called the Stalin Note of March 1952, offering free elections during which all four occupying powers, he offered, could supervise to check there was nothing fixed. There would also be no more German repara reparations payments, uh, and his only stipulation was that Germany would not join NATO and would remain totally neutral. You all. That sounds like a really reasonable offer, doesn't it? If only it didn't come from a man who had shown time and time again that under no circumstances should he be trusted. The problem was, for us, that Stalin knew we would never trust him, so he could make the most generous, seemingly peaceful offers possible, could offer things that even he himself didn't really want to happen, and know full well that we'd never accept. Therefore, making us look like the bad guys. I never liked Stalin, but you gotta appreciate what your enemies are capable of. And this was a very smooth move, but would you have trusted him? Course you wouldn't. You're not an idiot. Neither are we. Another big problem with leaving a unified, neutral Germany, if indeed we had decided to accept this seemingly offer that, you know, you're the saying that if something's too good, seems too good to be true, it probably is. Well, another problem, even if we'd accepted it, was that a neutral Germany, right next to Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe, would undoubtedly have come under Soviet pressure, without the US and its allies stationed in West Germany. We couldn't let it happen, and the Federal Republic of Germany Chancellor Mr. Adenauer didn't want it to happen either. Smart move, though, Stalin, to make us look like the bad guys. Smart move. My assertion that they wanted to hold on to power wherever they could is supported yet further by the plan to develop the European coal and steel community so that Western European nations could exploit the industrial capacity and coal resources of the Rhineland in Western Germany to help with their rearmaments program because they wanted to, you know, intimidate us. They needed to pay for that. The ECSC was formed in July 1952. So now there was both a military alliance of Western nations instigated by the United States in the form of NATO and an economic alliance too, so that they could pay for their expansionist plots. Out 
We formed our own economic alliance in Eastern Europe in 1949 called Comic Con. But as with everything else, we did not try to do anything provocative to risk world peace and delayed forming a military alliance until May 1955, although this is many years after the formation of NATO, the Western propaganda continued to say that it was us rather than them that wanted to, well, dominate the entire world. <laughs> How ridiculous that people even suggested this was all the fault of the Soviet Union. We act after the capitalist every single time. We are responding to their provocative actions, their domineering, their warmongering. So Stalin reacted to this, uh, I, like any bully would do, uh, by trying to bully the people that he could bully, which in this case was the German Democratic Republic, and all of the Germans who were unlucky enough to live there. The GDR had Comic-Con imposed upon it in 1950, which was a big group of Eastern European nations agreeing to work together to create a communist economic bloc in which they could all trade, but there'd be no private enterprise, everything run and controlled by the state, like communists. All East German farmers were forced to work together in huge collective farms, instead of on their own private farms. Production in the direction of the economy was all controlled by the central government, completely removing the freedom of decision of people working in both agriculture and industry. They had no choice about this. They had to do it. The Soviets also insisted that, just like the Soviets did themselves, the Germans, had, the East Germans, had to create five-year plans for the economy, which is another example of Soviet baloney, because the five-year plans weren't plans at all. They were more like five-year targets, in which each industry, each manager, each worker were given totally unrealistic targets to meet at work. Stalin died in March 1953, but in the eight years since the end of World War II, the pressure and the misery on those poor Germans trapped in the East must have been unbearable. Back in Germany, the United States continued to try to provoke us by broadcasting their propaganda across the German Democratic Republic in the East through Radio Free Europe. Then, despite broadcasting their propaganda across the country that was not theirs, they had the cheek to say that we were trying to keep the truth from the people of the GDR by, by attempting to block or jam the signal. Truth! Ha! The Americans would not know the truth if it beat them on the air. Then, when President Eisenhower took control of the United States, one of the first things he said when Remember, we are trying to maintain world peace. President Eisenhower said that the atomic bomb was just another weapon in our arsenal. As if it was any ordinary weapon, and he wasn't afraid to use it. <laughs> Sounds like bullying tactics to me again. What about you? He's trying to intimidate. It's all about intimidation with those dumb capitalists. You'd think the gloves would be off by then, eh? Wrong. You'd think we'd gone back to them. No, despite everything, we Soviets still continued to conduct ourselves with dignity. And in 1953, in the early part of 1953, we made another pro pro proposal for German unity. With the idea this time, because every other reasonable suggestion we made was ignored or denied, this time we said perhaps we could have politicians from the East and politicians from the West who could join in a coalition government. Needless to say, the West rejected it again. You might wonder why we were so desperate to have German unity. Well, apart from having the uh, concerns of the entire world and the German people best in our hearts, it was also costing us an absolute fortune to keep paying for all of these rearmaments which we had to do because the United States and its allies kept ramping up the pressure. If we could have a united neutral Germany as a, a sort of a neutral state between the East and the West, it would have cost us a lot less money in the rearmaments. Well, 
They rejected it anyway. Typical capitalists. Every attempt at world peace, every attempt to unite Germany, it is not us denying it, it is the capitalists. And yet they still blame us for the Cold War. Ridiculous. I ain't joking about the unbearable bearable bit either. Because despite all the oppression, the East German secret police called the Stasi, and the constant threat of imprisonment or even death, the Germans, despite all of this, living in East Germany, rose up in protest in June 1953. It was triggered specifically by the misery inflicted through the economic five-year plans, and especially when Ulbricht increased the targets in East Germany by 10%. They were already ridiculously high. He increased it further, with no warning and little justification in June 1952, a year before all this broke out. Then he arrested leading non-communist politicians when grumblings of unrest started. Hundreds of thousands of East Germans fled to the West, which is yet more proof that we in the West were the protectors of Germans because there weren't any fleeing to live in the East. And the Soviets claims that we were using the whole idea of protecting the Germans as an excuse to keep our military and therefore our influence in Western Europe was complete rubbish. And another example of the despicable, downright, absolute lies of the Soviet Union. And I'll tell you another thing. The Germans rose up, including 100,000 Berliners, or East Berliners, on the 16th of June, 1953. But also, not just in Berlin, all across towns and cities all over the GDR. In a place called Gorlitz and in another place called Bitterfeld, some poor souls even tried to take over government buildings to try to wrest control back from the communists. So, Walter Ulbricht saw that the Germans didn't want him. And the Soviets realized they hadn't been fair. So they all pulled out and everything went back to normal. Of course it didn't! Ulbricht asked the Soviets to send in their tanks because he didn't even trust the loyalty of his own goddamn police force and 125 Germans ended up dead and many more injured with the result being that the Soviets kept control of East Germany against the will of the East German people. Don't want to be an American, idiot! So you might be wondering what we were doing through all of this. Well, we couldn't do a damn thing without risking nuclear war. So we encouraged the East Germans with our radio broadcasts and gave resources, support and care to any East German who left to come to live in the FRG, like any decent human beings would do. It brings a tear to my eye at what we did for those poor Germans. Makes me proud to be American. Can we and so to the last and really... Quite a serious event that we will discuss here today in our briefing. The American dogs and the Federal Republic of Germany used money and bribes to convince people to move from the east to the west. So as to try to use, well, they had greater wealth than we did. And they used this to their advantage. Why did they have greater wealth than we did? Well, partly because we had had to face the Nazi brunt of the invasion and they had not. So they... And this is partly because of the Americans, remember, for not opening the Second Front until 1944. So, they take advantage of their superiority in wealth and resources to pay for people to come to the West from the East. It crippled the German economy, or it had the potential to anyway. Every time somebody migrated through Berlin to the West, they knew they would be rewarded. This was a disaster for us, as we lost many skilled workers. And we had to respond by setting higher targets for the people who were left in the East to meet at work. We needed them to produce more. It was a real disaster, because you imagine you are a doctor, and you are uh, living in East Germany for the socialist state, uh, and uh, over the other side, the capitalists are promising you great wealth. People, these people who moved, were very selfish, because... They were undermining a state which was trying to care for the benefits of all people so that they could get rich quick at the expense of people in the West. Anyway, it was an entire disaster for us and we had to set higher targets to everybody working in the factories and things. The capitalists seized on this as an opportunity to turn the people against the GDR and their radio-free Europe and other capitalist agents managed to incite people in the GDR to go on protest, uh, to strike, and then when the strike began, 
They continued to broadcast information across eastern Germany, as far as we couldn't block the signal anyway, uh, about where the protests were happening. So people could listen to the capitalist radio, find out where the strikes were happening and go and join in. They were trying to sabotage everything about our state. They tried to prolong the strikes and protests, but with absolutely no intention of stepping in, of course. They just wanted to cause trouble that we had to deal with, but they weren't going to step in themselves. Typical cowardly action of a capitalist is get the workers in the East to do the dirty work whilst they told them what to do via radio. Exploit the ordinary people for their own gain. The Red Army, of course, in the end, we had little choice but to crush the revolt and arrest the capitalist agents in the East that were responsible for all of this. Again, our actions are determined by the actions of the capitalists and the United States is the people behind all of this. They encourage people to move to the West. We have to set higher targets. They encourage strikes and we have to send in the army. They always have the first action. Who's that chick that's rocking kicks? She's gotta be from out of town. In the aftermath of the East German uprising of summer 1953, the GDR and the Soviet Union simply wanted to be left alone. We'd had enough sick of the pressure. The economic cost of rearmament and the tension caused by the constant warmongering of the Allies on the other side. But, of course, they did not give us chance to be left alone, because the West allowed the FRG, West Germany, to join NATO in 1955, and then began to allow for the West Germans to rearm. What had we been worried about for all of these years? Germany invading the Soviet Union again. This is what we wanted more than anything else to prevent this from happening because of all the deaths. 25 million. What if this had been your country? 25 million of your ancestors dead and then the capitalists rearming the country that did this. And this was the second time they had invaded the Russian land back in the First World War as well. And now they allow the Germans to rearm. Just eight years after the Germans had tried to dominate all of Europe for the second time in 50 years. And they were given the Germans weapons. Oh look, it is my cat again. How wonderful that he has turned up to stand in front of my camera. I will pick him up. Say hello, Nigel. Hello, Nigel. Now where were we? If you listen to the capitalist propaganda, you may still think we reacted to the further provocation with anger of our own. Maybe even still, despite all I have told you, you think it was us who was at fault. Well, we did form our own uh, version of NATO called the Warsaw Pact. It was an Eastern European military alliance. Uh, and it was kind of like NATO in that all members of the Eastern Bloc agreed to help one another in the event of being attacked. However, unlike NATO, we had a very important call clause in the contract which stated that we would get rid of the Warsaw Pact if, I'll do the quote Max, a general European treaty of collective security was signed. In other words, if the capitalists decided to stop acting like and agreed to stop rearmaments and to work with us, then we would disband the Warsaw Pact, but of course the West had no interest in this. <laughs> Finally, we agreed to host the West German Chancellor Adenauer. We agreed to bring him and invite him to Moscow. After all of this, to negotiate the final release of German prisoners of war from the Second World War. This was in September 1959. We hoped to use this as an opportunity to open the idea of German unity. What we got instead... This stupid cat. What we got instead was uh, Adenauer announcing something called the Hallstein Doctrine. This doctrine stated that Adenauer would remove diplomatic ties with any country that recognized the GDR as an independent state. Uh, so, and it would be recognized as an unfriendly act as well. Another example in a very long list of outrages by the capitalists intent on making life difficult for us. Let us not forget the cheek of this. It was the West who was continuously denying opportunities for German unity. And therefore the dismantling of 
well, Germany itself into two separate parts was the West's fault. And the West created the FRG before we created the GDR. It was like they had forced the creation of the GDR and then tried to punish us for creating it. What were we going to do? Just let them carry on on their own? And there you have it. There are lots of different events or aspects, but the traditionalist, and in my humble opinion, the correct view of uh, the German country during this period, with respect to us, why there were so many clashes, was because we, the United States of America, were determined to stand up to the aggression and amb ambitions of the communists as they tried to spread their hateful ideology across the whole of Germany. We were the protectors of freedom, and of the German people, and when I think back... To all the billions we spent helping the German people in their time of need, rebuilding their economy when the Russians wanted to cripple it, providing resources when the Soviets tried to starve the Berliners out, and providing aid to those that wanted to come west, it makes me so proud, proud to have been and to still be an American. That's it from the traditionalist explanation and the right explanation. With me. Bruce nearly forgot that. And so that is it. We were constantly bullied by the capitalist attempt to create a European economic and military alliance in opposition to the Soviet Union, and every attempt at trying to achieve German unity was rebuffed by the capitalists. The actions of the capitalists, in particular the United States, clearly caused constant clashes over Germany throughout the Cold War, and this is categorically why the revisionist interpretation of the classes in Germany, the clashes in Germany, was the correct interpretation and continues to be. I thank you very much. I was Boris. Goodbye. Though without clearly, obviously stating it. No, that's not... Stalin wasn't keeping quiet about... Ah, uh, damn it. 1948, we were perhaps, well, 1945, 6, 7, maybe to begin with, right at the start. I don't know what I'm talking, it's all gone wrong, I'll start again. Stand by and let the West do as they pleased. Oh dear, it seems my cat has entered the room and opened the door. I will shut it. Don't want to be American, idiot! <laughs>